Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. You are listening to The Robbie Rowe Show, episode 80 with Kyle Bodie. Let's hear a soundbite from Kyle. I think people say this a lot, and it's mostly true. Everyone that's drafted or everyone that's an affiliate ball has a chance, has the tools to make it happen. Um, there's a way to compete. There's a way to contribute to the 40-man roster if you're in affiliate ball. I do believe that. Uh, it may be very hard. There's some people who are in the 40th round, and they understand they're an organizational player, and they're probably not going to get the same chances. But there's a chance if everything breaks right, that guy can help the team somehow. And uh, it's just the separator is the guys that really want to play baseball. Listen to clear the, the Robbie Rose Show. The Robbie Rose Show. Yo, what is up, guys? It's your host, Robbie Rowland of The Robbie Rose Show. I uh, want to thank you personally for tuning in today. The, the guest on my show today, I believe, needs no introduction whatsoever if you follow baseball or if you're in the realm of baseball training um, and you don't know about this individual, that's actually very, very impressive, um, if you ask me. Kyle Bodie joins The Robbie Rowe Show in episode 80 today. Kyle is the founder and CEO of Driveline Baseball. Again, if you do not know Driveline Baseball, that's impressive. And you're in the baseball industry, obviously. Um, like I said, he needs no introduction. Um, I believe everyone knows about him. I'm sure everyone uh, that uh, that's my audience um, either follows him on Instagram, Twitter, uh, checked out his website, or has thrown plyo balls once or twice in your life. <laughs> but uh, what I will say before we get right to the episode is, like I said, my name is Robbie Rowland. I am the host of The Robbie Rowe Show. If you have yet to subscribe to the show, I encourage you to do so to not miss out on any exclusive uh, content, educational baseball training content that I'll be, uh, that I'll be producing here. I've, uh, I've said it on my show before. I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity, especially when it comes to like podcasting and having the ability to, to reach you know, an audience is the, the simple fact that uh, the, the things that I don't know and the things that I'm not very well versed in, I'm able to reach out to guys like Kyle Bodie over at Driveline and, and bring them on the show and, and talk about things. You know, Not only does it better, better me as an individual, but hopefully it, uh, it goes hand in hand with the, the simple foundation that I've established by doing what I do, um, you know, and that's, uh, that's supplying you guys with as much content, information, educational content about the game of baseball that I can possibly do. With that being said, um, if you have no idea who I am, <laughs> I would encourage you to, to check some of the stuff that I got going on. Uh, mostly active on Instagram, Robbie Row one two. You can check me out there, R-O-B-B-Y, R-O-W-1-2. Um, but I also encourage you um, for this specific episode and the episodes to come to check out the show notes over at therobbyroshow.com forward slash Bodhi 80 at B-O-D-D-Y 80 um, I will link that in the description of whatever platform you're listening to this on. So you can just go over there and click that. Um, the show notes will have all of the links talked about within this episode. Um, it'll have the documentary video that Watch Momentum just did on Kyle, and as well as um, you know more information about me and my services that I could provide you if you're a aspiring pitcher in the game of baseball. So. Uh, like I said, thank you guys for tuning in to the Robbie Rose Show. Um, I appreciate you guys and, and uh, strongly encourage you to hit that subscribe button, not just because it's my show, but um, just the simple fact of I do believe that there's value to be had in being an active listener, especially if you're you know an aspiring baseball player um, you know that, that's wanting to improve his game. So thank you guys again, and thank you for Kyle for tuning in. Let's, uh, let's get to the show. All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We are live. We have episode 80. Um, I, dude, I, I totally forgot to ask you. Is it Bodhi or Body? Bodhi. It's Bodhi, right? Yeah. yeah okay. You got it. All right, man. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we got Kyle Bodhi here on the show, episode 80 of The Robbie Rowe Show. Kyle, thank you so much, dude, for coming on. I know we planned... Uh, we we started talking hit, get, hitting a a show like last year, towards the end of last year, but now we, we finally got it locked in. So uh, appreciate you coming on, man. 
Yeah, it's supposed to be episode 39, but uh, here we are. Double, <laughs> double sets. Good. I, I, I just uh, to your yeah. longevity and patience with me. So <laughs> we're nah, good. No, dude. I, like I said before we started recording, man, as I know how it is, dude. Especially like a guy. I, I mean, you're, I'm probably very similar to you are. We just dive dive into like 40 different projects at once, right? And then you're just like, holy oh, smokes, dude. What am I doing? But um, uh, dude, so starting off the show, man, I just want to say, dude, from uh, from just an overall baseball fan and a, a total geek of the game, I just want to I want to thank you, man, for I speak probably for a lot of my audience as well for what you're doing, um, you know, within the baseball community. It's funny because like I even have written down here, man. Like when when people think of baseball performance, when they think of baseball training, they think of driveline baseball now. And uh, I want to ask, man, like, did you could you ever envision to this when when you started this out? Yeah, I, I don't know how large I, I thought. Um I, I was going to get, you know, to be honest with you, I was just want, I was coaching the little league and I, I, I always had the goal of trying to coach inside professional baseball. So to be honest with you, my whole goal is to become a pitching coach or a pitching coordinator inside affiliate ball. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I had built the business a little bit, coached some people, some guys went on to play college ball and then a few guys went on to play pro ball, uh, Caleb Cotham and Ryan Buckter, who's still playing right now, uh, with Oakland, he's in the big leagues. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I just when I got my offer to become a rehab coach uh, with the Astros uh, back in 2012 or 13 or so, uh, it was actually 13 or 14, and I decided I'm just going to take a chance on myself and grow the business. You know, so that was a real kind of a deciding moment right there. Wow, that's fantastic. What I, I mean, like. What is I know like we before we hit record I, I didn't want to dive too much into your background because I do want for those of you guys who are listening there's a there's an 18 minute clip watch momentum just produced it on YouTube I'll include that in the show notes as far as Kyle Bodie's background but uh, real brief man for the audience can you kind of explain like how I know you said you were coaching little league and all this how how that kind of came into fruition as far as your background and your love for the game of baseball and how did it evolve into to driveline. Yeah, I played uh, just played baseball. wasn't nearly as good as you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> I don't and, know about uh, that. <laughs> decided to. I, I, I was really frustrated because I got injured while young. Were uh, you a pitcher though? Ago. Yeah, I was okay. a two-way player. I played a lot of mostly third base, and I just threw hard <laughs> off the mound. <laughs> uh, so I closed, and but my hurt my arm when I was fourteen. Um, and I was uh, six feet tall when I was fourteen. And I was throwing like upper seventies, touching eighty, and so I would just throw like you know one hundred seventy, one hundred eighty pitches a game. It didn't matter, mm-hmm. uh, just because we didn't. You know, we didn't know. I grew up in Cleveland, and my dad was a minor league hockey player, and just didn't. He didn't know a lot about baseball, but he you know knew a lot about toughness. Um, right. And it's not like. I was abused or anything like that. I just, you know how it is. You know, when you play, you just, when you're a kid, you just play all the time. You know, you just pitch all the time. There's no concept of pitch counts and all that, you know. Um, and so I hurt my arm and it took forever to rehab, something I think you know a lot about. Yeah. And just didn't have a lot of, I, I didn't get a lot of good answers to it. And I think y- your rehab story is why we've connected in the first place, maybe, or why we started talking, right. which is, you know, you want very specific um, answers. You know, there's always going to be, who the hell knows what's going on when you're hurt, right? You always know that. But you want, like, a specific timeline. What can I tackle? You're an athlete. You're a competitor. Set up eight cones for me and let me knock down eight <laughs> as far as possible. Don't give me a checklist. Don't give me, like, this or that. Give me very specific target stuff. I think it's why, you know, you connect well with the people that you do. Mm-hmm. And I do the same. So when my injury didn't rehab the way I wanted to and I, I never really got back to throwing uh, hard again, I wanted to know why and if I was going to coach kids – I wanted to take a much more data-driven approach to give them more kind of satisfactory answers. And really, that's the entire genesis of Driveline and why it is the way it is. Man, so that's I mean that's the, that's the foundation right there, man. Holy smoke! So that's that's how it happened. I want to real quickly. I got a few questions regarding this on Instagram. Was like. Uh, the whole pitch count epidemic. So, do you are are you in favor, out of favor, of as far as like the whole pitch count things uh, being so restricted nowadays, especially like in the little league? Yeah, I, I think we all know that they're not um, that they're not very good. You know, I, I think that we all know that pitch counts aren't the best. Um, however, we do know that uh, there's a lot of coaches who are just irresponsible you know so we need to we need to have something so unfortunately i think pitch counts are a imperfect but good answer currently while we search for the next one because Uh there's coaches who will just you know they want to win before they put a 12 year old's arm uh, ahead of them and um that's that's a tough thing so we just we we need something yeah no i got you um so like i said before we we uh we started recording man was like uh i think outside looking in a lot of people saw driveline as just the place that you throw away to balls right and you grunt and you, you throw as hard as you can and and intent and all that stuff 
Um, and, and now it's kind of evolved into like what you said, this data driven approach, man, is like, it, was that something from the start that you wanted to, to kind of uh, be about as far as like the data driven approach? Or why was there a misconception as far as like, just, oh, we only throw away the balls? Yeah, it was always a data-driven approach, and I think people who have seen either the documentary or read MVP Machine, which is out, which is out yesterday or two right. days ago, and uh, read our blog, there's a lot of it is uh, we didn't like weighted balls for years. We didn't use them, and I hated them. Really? <laughs> and, yeah, absolutely. So it's kind of funny that it's we've gotten associated with it. Actually, what happened was is uh, my partner at the time, Jacob Staff. He ordered um, like a, a rehab, like a two pound rehab ball, you know, to do some like stuff. a plyo he, ball. Kind of, yeah, but it was actually like steel. It was like oh, just gosh. magic steel. But yeah, it was crazy. It was like a, it was a baseball. Uh, it had leather, uh, but it was a steel core. You get it from frozen ropes, I think. Okay. And um, it's the size of a baseball. Huh. But the thing is, is that they sent him the wrong thing. They sent him a bag of weighted baseballs, uh, and he com- he called them and said, hey, you sent me the wrong thing. I'll send it back. And they're like, ah, just keep it, and we'll send you the, the, the two-pound ball mm-hmm. as well. So it's good customer service for frozen ropes. So right. they did. Shout out. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, they – I asked this bag of balls was just sitting in the garage for like three months, just our, our training facility. And I was like – I was cleaning things out. I'm like, what? You know, what is this? Let's get this out of here. And he was like, no, nah, you know – you say, like, I'm like, these things hurt kids' arms and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, you know, and he kind of took me to task. He's like, you don't know that. You know, you have no idea if that's true. You know, we got to measure this stuff and see if it's, you know, you can't just state things. Mm-hmm. And I said, ah, yeah, shit, you're probably right. So then I, I talked to some physical therapists and I talked to some doctors and how we could measure it. And we put kind of a training program together. And uh, turns out that they work really well. <laughs> I mean, uh, developing throwing velocity and then pitching velocity. And yeah, it's kind of how it all started. But uh, initially, I didn't want anything to do with it. But uh, yeah. the reason that I think we're connected with it, I mean, it's how we made our name. So I don't right. think it's unfair either. You know, like that's that's how we made our name. People, obviously, there are a lot of people using weighted balls before us. There was Tom House. There was right. Dr. Duke Duren. There was Nolan Ryan. There was there were all uh, Mariano Rivera, right? There's tons of players and, and coaches who used it. Ron Wolforth, Paul Nyman. But we really kind of um uh, we pop, for whatever reason our company caught on fire and so as a result we're kind of the ones associated with it um yeah. but i give all credit to the people before us and i think we've just taken it a little bit further you know right well with that with that segue as far as like taking it a little bit further is like how did you kind of develop that because i know uh you know even for me as, as a ball player i remember i was going to puerto rico and i was like kind of like okay like what is this whole weight of ball thing about? You guys had your, your, your plyo throws is what you call it. And uh, I'm curious as far as like how that kind of came into fruition as far as establishing like certain throws with certain weights um, did certain things for like the arm as far as like, you know, elbow spiraling and all that stuff. How did that come to come to be? Yeah, it's just uh, we had to start with something. You know, right. we had to start with a basic plan. So we took like a lot of throw weighted ball. To Ren. He had published some research. So I'm like, you know what, let's just let's start with that. And then um, over time, it's like, okay, that's way too many throws. <laughs> you know, you're talking like 75 like, pull downs in a day or whatever, or right. 75 weighted ball throws off the mound. It's like, all right, that's too many. You know, let's, uh, <laughs> let's, right. let's uh, kind of dial it in. And then we kind of stumbled upon those plyo balls. And for a long time, we used um, the athletic pitcher type stuff from Ron Wolforth, the, the balls from Oat Specialties. Right. Uh, but it turns out that, like, the way that we were using them, um, um, like they just broke a lot because they weren't really rated for you know throwing really hard. So then we had to develop kind of our own set uh, of balls and use them the way that we wanted to, which is more like positional stuff. I, I always thought like you know like uh, the the dry work drills and all the position stuff and all the uh, circuit throws you do you do it in pro ball you do it in college right you do it in high school probably where your coach has a set of drills that you do right, right? and it, whatever it is right. Um, Coordinator was probably Liliquist, right? When you were there, oh yeah, um, yeah. So there was like everyone has their own type of thing that they want to do, and so I, I was no different than that. I like that. I like some drills to break it up. But then I also thought, you know, there's a lot of interesting research and in motor research, motor control research that shows if you vary the weight of the implement, you get better results. So I was like, why don't we just do these drills with um, weighted balls, you know, with and different size balls and stuff? And I think it might be more effective. Uh, and it turns out that yeah, it really is. And then also if you have the weighted the, the soft shell. Ball, Balls, uh, you don't need a throwing partner, as you know. I mean, you, you, you are a big proponent on oh, Instagram yeah. of saying, like, just get your own throwing in, you know. So it's a nice way to, um, you know, because the big problem in rehab too is, you know, like you have you have to throw often. You have a lot of frequency, but kind of low volume and intensity. 
And so it's like, hey, it's Tuesday. I got to go play catch to 30 feet and, like, you know, do all this stuff. Who wants to go do that? And your friends are like, I'm not doing that. You know, it sounds terrible, right? So oh, yeah. you got to set up a net and all that. So it's like there's there's a lot of ways that you can get your own work in but still get a really good training stimulus. And that's kind of the reason behind it. Why do you think – maybe an unfair question, but why do you think there are so many people a lot more back then when they kind of first you know started getting mainstream? Why, why were so many people just anti? Like, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like it was one of those, like – culture things where it was like you're either for it or you're against it because i know there was a couple like you know research papers that got produced as far as like oh well we think it does this and we do that and i mean if you can like take us in i know that's kind of a loaded question but no uh, yeah i think it's i think it's fair though because it's the same reason i was anti-weighted balls right it just seems like different yeah yeah it just seems dangerous right you have a ball and you have a really light one and you have a really heavy one and your arm and, and, and in baseball right we we all deal with injuries right so to do anything that's heavier or lighter it's it seems dangerous i think that's very fair you know but it's uh but if you really read into the research and you really think about um just the stuff you did as a kid right like i think a lot of us like threw a ton with uh tennis balls and pine cones and you know, footballs <laughs> and stuff like that and you think about if you really think about it like that's that's the stuff that we all did and it's funny because you read all these stories about like greg maddox and you know tom glavin and these guys with exceptional command and they would throw tennis balls and, and racquetballs and baseballs it doesn't matter right whatever they super balls it doesn't matter against a garage against the target they would tape off size of a strike zone you know stand roughly 60 feet away who knows if it was right uh the garage and then they would throw uphill they would throw downhill and they would try to really focus on throwing strikes with all do- sorts of stuff just being so an athlete <laughs> yeah it's, it turns you just do something you do a lot of you end up being good at and so it turns out that like that's that's really not any different than what we're trying to do and it's funny that we've gotten away from it i think it's too too much tournament ball it's too many games you know 140 plus games in the minor leagues and, and people say like oh that's the way to build skill it's just like that's it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me you know that's oh, not we, we, we know oh. we know that that's not we know that that's not how it is you know and then uh, the 140 games is primarily for the position players i think we all know is <laughs> they, yeah, they just need yeah. a lot of at bats but the pitchers don't need to be doing a lot of that work and so it just some of it is is we have to play games because there have to be games to be played but then there's also just like a lot of inertia and i think you're seeing it you're seeing it change pretty rapidly over the last five years yeah i want to di- kind of dive into that briefly as far as like dude i just posted something on like if you should play summer ball or not right and i think there's got to be a, a point in every individual or in every athlete's journey in which they have to like sit back and go okay like you know it's the same thing with showcases like do i have something to showcase do i have a major skill that sticks out to scouts or recruiters or whatever like I mean, I would say like you guys are kind of the first ones on the scene to kind of ask that question, right? Bring about that question as far as like, yo, like if you don't have anything that stands out, maybe it's a better idea to skip playing summer ball and focus on training. Like how, how did that kind of come up, come about for you guys? It's frustrating because the Pacific Northwest, you know, we don't have winter ball here, so yeah. we don't, we don't see that, but we do have year round training and we do have select ball, um, is really bad out here. Like the summer ball is just, the circuit is crazy. And I had, I didn't know if it was just me or if it was, you know, just how it is. But I've asked a lot of coaches and a lot of recruiters and they all say the Pacific Northwest is, is one of the worst areas when it comes to politics and, and games played and all that. So mm-hmm. it was just watching a lot of unsatisfactory baseball. There was a time when I moved here 13 years ago that the baseball here was I mean, tremendous. You know, when draft and follow was a thing and there right. was year round, you know, you could take for a long time to sign. And you just recently talked about how you signed really fast on your Instagram, yeah. but you know, you could, you could have held that for a whole year. Right. right. And well, our sixth pick were, didn't sign. <laughs> <laughs> that There's year. a lot of kids that do that and they used yeah. to, you know, and what they did is here, uh, they would hold out and then they would just go play in the, in a, the Juco circuit out here in the Northwest because our Juco league is not affiliated with the NJCAA mm-hmm. and we play wood bats. So, so you're playing against really good talent. And so that really elevated the level of play. Kids were watching junior college baseball and they were watching, you know, they were watching kids that were, you know, first rounders, second rounders that are just waiting to sign, you know, or they're draft and follow kids. Yeah. And it really elevated the game. And so you're, when you grow up around that kind of talent, that's that's why big leaguers kids do so well right because they emulate their fathers sure. and they they're, they're around really good talent they see good mechanics every day sure. um and then when you play a ton of showcase ball there's just not a lot of time for development which means you know kids aren't getting very good and the level of quality is very poor so as a result it's this negative feedback cycle if you only have to throw 82 and locate a breaking ball to get everyone out then that's all you're going to do. Why would you ever want to throw 90? Why right. would you ever want to throw 95? Why would you ever be pushed? Because, you know, you, you get pushed, right? That, and right. that's what makes someone better. And so 
it's frustrating. Um, I, I don't actually think – I think a lot of people think the adults are being greedy and they're trying to make a lot of money off sure. these kids. But there's a lot of money to be made too. That's yeah. true and I just don't find that to be the, the case. I don't think anyone's going in trying to make a shitload of money off like five-year-olds or 10-year-olds. Right. I, 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 I haven't met anyone like that that bad. Everyone loves baseball right. and they're trying to put on good events and they're trying to do what's right for the kids. I, I really believe that and I think – it's just ended up in a place where uh, it's tough. Not a lot of people are pushing that development message. Although you know they are now, but they, right. they weren't. Ten, they weren't ten years ago. It's such a fine line, though, right? Like, I 100%. mean, I, I look at it like you know, if I was a parent, like, yeah, I'd want a, my kid to play as much as possible, right? Like to to enjoy the game and love the game. And and I even talked about it like on an IGTV, dude. It was like growing up, it was just something that we did. You know, like when summer came, it was like we're playing basketball, we're playing baseball, we're doing all of this stuff, and and, uh, and and I think it's just so prevalent nowadays, dude. Because like you turn on a major league baseball game, and and you know you're not seeing like for maybe a fine line, you're not seeing like the 88, 90 guys anymore, right? So like the uh, the level of competition, as far as at least velocity development for me personally, has like gone way up. So now it's like that room for error, that margin for error as as ball players is, is like not there, not existent, man. You got to get in the gym, you got to freaking start developing your velocity, you got to do all these things. Um, but that kind of segue to the next question that i have for you man is like i want to know i just saw that instagram post you made of i think it was a a guy throwing against a plyo ball a uh, plyo wall uh, like a gray ball uh, and hitting a pr and everyone's screaming and yelling you know and that just that culture like is that something that you wanted to establish early on or is that just something that that kind of came about with with the players that you brought in yeah that's a really Good question, and we get it a, a fair amount of time because everyone, pro coaches, and, and and they all visit, and the college coaches, and they're like, "This is unbelievable! Like right. this culture is like what we need." And how do we? How did you do it? And uh, the, the answer is, I have no idea. <laughs> like, basically, <laughs> we we really selected the athletes, and, and it turns out that when you give athletes tangible things to go after, it's like, "Hey, today you got to throw everything." You got to throw these balls over these velocities, or, or honestly, if you're rehabbing, like we we do a lot of, you can't throw a baseball over 80 miles an hour today. All right, tomorrow you can't throw a baseball over 81. Right? We want to titrate it, and when you give an athlete those kind of goals, then competition comes naturally. You know, and then they try to compete with each other. They try to record everything. They can look yep. at two weeks ago, the last month, the last two months. You know, in our software called Track, they can say, here's the trend lines, here's where I'm going, here's my wellness questionnaire, am I sleeping? And it turns out that these guys are going to compete everywhere. They compete on the wellness questionnaire. Like, are they getting enough sleep? Are they hydrating enough? Do they feel good? They do all these testings. And then when, they, when they're, they're excited to retest and see all their numbers go up on really boring stuff. And it's right. the same stuff that I've told everyone. If you measure this stuff and you tell them there's a positive correlation between getting a lot of sleep and eating right and, and hydrating, then they're going to do it. You know, they'll actually pay attention, which I know you're a big proponent of oh, yeah. with uh, all your sleep apps and, and stuff like that. You know, that's the stuff that really matters. And But you can't just tell a kid, you got to sleep eight hours because your mom's been telling you that since you were five, <laughs> right? You got to you got to say like if you sleep an average of eight hours over four weeks, you're gonna reduction of injuries this percent based on our database, or you're more likely to gain velocity. Yeah. And when you tell them that kind of stuff with hard numbers, then they compete. You know why is Fortnite popular? Why is Call of Duty popular? Why are video games Overwatch? Why are these games so popular? Why do people watch esports? Why do people watch Twitch and YouTube? It's because numbers, views, counts, kills, leaderboards, rankings, sponsorships. It's all numbers right and that's how kids are that's how kids are wired their kids are wired for instant gratification yeah. and we can complain about that a lot of coaches complain about it and i think there's a valid concern there but additionally you just got to tap into it you know you got to connect with them it's not their job to connect with you it's your job to connect with them and so then that's kind of how the culture has really organically grown into what it has and it's really policed by the longtime trainees it's it's policed by guys like rob hill and eric jakers who now work for us and it's it's policed by guys like trevor bauer Casey Weathers, um, you know, it's it's policed by guys who who really grew up in the environment and want to see it succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, it pains me to do this, but I have to set aside a brief moment here to hear a word from the advertisers. You you mentioned those those two names as far as uh, Weathers and Bauer. Like, what what are some of the things like? the individuals the athletes have like taught you over the time of you know since the introduction of driveline the number one thing i tell every time is that and i, I know you can certainly agree with this like yeah. 
you seem like a guy that loves to have fun, joke around, bullshit at the field, and all that. And pros are better at it. Yeah, and pros are better at it than anything. Right? It's the best thing about baseball. And you, everyone has that one bullpen guy who just talks way too much. But uh, besides that, <laughs> guilty. Like, yeah, it's but it's fun. You know, you talk. But then when it's time to work, it's time to throw your bullpen. It's time to throw your side. It's time to compete on the mound, or it's time to lift weights. It doesn't matter. Like if you're, they have a switch. The really good pro athletes are really loose and talk a lot of crap and bullshit and have a lot of fun. And then when and then when it's time to do anything that might make them better, they don't say anything. Yeah. You can't talk to them. You can't bother them. That you shut them out. They shut everyone out and they compete. And th- and that's the number one thing I really learned. Like that's the biggest difference between a pro versus a college guy versus a high school guy. Like there's people that can switch on. There's people that are too serious and then they they don't ever get loose and they don't get, appreciate the game. And then you have people who are too loose, which yeah. I think is more common. And they never really get in the zone. But then yeah. there's those guys that can switch it on and off, and it's crazy to watch. And Trevor's like that, and Casey's really like that. And that most of the pros that we have that are successful are like that. I mean, would you say that that's kind of like the – I mean, I know you kind of mentioned it already. Is like that's the one thing, right? Because as far as like the talent level, I mean, you're probably seeing high school guys – you know, as far as like pitch design and stuff on Rap Soto, like, I mean, very similar to some of the pro guys, right? Oh, yeah. Like I, I posted on Twitter, there's a local semi pro team that has a bunch of like ex affiliate pros and some college washouts and just some dudes mm-hmm. and our biomechanist pitches on it. And the average velocity of that team is higher than the Mariners. You know, it's just like they're just, <laughs> you know, they're just like they're with our starters. They're, they have two starters that are 92 to 94, or touch 96. You know, they have a starter that's 86 to 89, touching 90. Uh, and their closer is 90-92, you know, uh, and he's a biomechanist. He's had two Tommy John surgeries. And it's like this team just, like, there's plenty of guys in here that would be pretty good, <laughs> you know, in pro ball. Yeah. But they decide they all work jobs and they have fun. And they most of them train at driveline and, and they have a lot of fun competing. And But they, they all understand that, like, the level is for fun, you know. And then right. they, they all also understand when they were professionals there was a reason that they're not playing anymore. And they've internalized it and why. And, and so we have them by to share a lot but yeah it's not just you know the separator is massive it's just it's right. mostly i think people say this a lot and it's mostly true everyone that's drafted or everyone that's an affiliate ball has a chance has the tools to make it happen um there's a way to compete there's a way to contribute to the 40-man roster if you're in affiliate ball i do believe that right. uh, it may be very hard there's some people who are in the 40th round and they understand they're an organizational player and they're probably not going to get the same chances but there's a chance if everything breaks right that guy can help the team somehow mm-hmm. and uh it's just the separator is the guys that really want to play baseball you know we had We've had a lot of guys who love putting on the uniform who say they want to rehab, who especially in rehab, but they say they want to train, they say they want to rehab, and they say they want to play baseball, but they just don't like the game. You know, they don't like it. And that's yeah. the scouting. That's the number one thing. That's why scouts are so valuable. I, don't, I won't get too far down that road, but old school scouts that are being pushed out of the game, it's frustrating because – they're, you know, they're the ones on the intangibles. There's there's first picks, there's first round picks, there's high picks who people draft and scouts are like, that kid doesn't even like baseball. Like, do they even know what they're doing? They're just looking at his velocity. They're looking at his break. They're looking at his stats. But if you sit down with this kid and you talk to his coaches, you talk to his trainers, you're like, this kid skips workouts. This kid doesn't even like, he has other interests, you know, like this kid doesn't even really want to play. He just right. plays because he's good and he plays because he's told he's supposed to play. And those guys get weeded out real fast. You guys just wrote a blog on that, right? Yeah, yeah, it's just it's frustrating, you know, yeah. because you see it, you see it a lot, and I know you've played with hundreds of people like that, I'm sure, who just play because they think they're supposed to play, you know, because they throw just because you throw 95 doesn't mean you have to play pro ball. Right? You know, there's a lot of guys who have a good arm or can hit for power, and they're like, well, I got to play because I'm good. It's like, no, right. you don't. and it's you frustrating know, too for the other guy too because they see yep. that guy and he doesn't care, he doesn't go to early work, he doesn't do all the workouts that you know maybe a less talented guy does, and then all of a sudden like this because this is the guy that's an all mid season all star with a two three and and you're grinding with a five, <laughs> right. right? Yeah, and those guys and they, and they bring down the club. To be honest with you, you know, it's those guys if they make the big league team and they contribute, all you've done is set a set a terrible signal for the rest of the team. You know, and there's a point where talent trumps the attitude, 100. percent That that you just gotta. Everyone's a professional; they all understand where they are in in the game. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if it's close, you know, you want the guys that actually play that they actually want to play the game and care and want want to do better because that's 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 how it works. It's what we saw with the Dodgers. You know, right. that was our first that was our first program. You know, in 2015, that we really worked with a major league team to do a velocity program. And these kids are all going to get cut. They're all org players. You know, they're at the bottom of it. They're all 80, 60, 88. You know, yeah. you know these guys are going to go to extended, and they're going to get cut. You oh. know, that's, that's the plan. But uh, they gave us them. They gave us 10 of them. 
Uh, one of them quit and retired, and then the other nine of them, three of them ended up gaining huge velocity. Two of them ended up going 92, 95, touching 97. Uh, and we're extremely thankful. And so then they got value for those guys. They reached double A, triple A, and they were traded. And, you know, so it worked out for them. But additionally, it wasn't just that. I don't think either the Dodgers or Noros really understood that this was going to happen. They had those kids that were terrible, 10 ERA in Ogden. Yeah. And they're leaping kids. It's a tough place high to pitch. <laughs> no, no doubt. And they're leaping kids in Ogden. They're, they're leaping kids in high A. They're going from Rancho to Tulsa. They're going to double A. And everyone in spring training is like, that kid sucked. And yeah. now he throws 95. What the hell happened? You know, and then they buy in. You know, so then they start to think. And then they look at the big league roster. And then Walker Bueller, best pit prospect in baseball at the mm. time, is pitching. And Walker Bueller throws weighted balls. And he lives in season. All mm. right. Well, if he does it and then our worst player does it, why the hell am I not doing it? Right. You know, so then it starts to ask a question. And then that's really – I really just described how the culture of driveline got to be the way it is. Sure. You just, you just get outcomes from both sides of people, um, and then you, you see a lot of people buy in in between. I mean, that's how that's literally like it spreads like wildfire in that regard, right? It's because yeah, like one player exactly. does it, and then I mean, you guys, you guys hit the scene, you know, right around Instagram when when that Instagram was getting big, right? So like myself included, like I wanted to freaking post my my weighted ball throws, man, and then one guy posts that, and then everyone else sees it, and they're like, "Well, that looks cool," you know, that's something that I could do probably before I throw a baseball, or that's something I can do when I'm not throwing a baseball in the off season, and next thing you know, everyone's freaking doing it, man. So right. uh, it's definitely uh, that's that's huge, man. Um, I, uh, I I want to talk about uh, just real quick. I, I know this is kind of one of the questions that I got a lot of as far as like from Instagram and, and other people was like the, the the training for velocity, right? It was kind of like one of those things you look, you know, f- rewind a decade earlier and velocity was just one of those God given things, right? God came down and, and blessed your right arm or left arm with a thunderbolt. And uh, that was just what it was. And now it's kind of like you mentioned with those stories of, of the kids in the Dodgers organization that they went from 86 to 95. So what do you, what would you say? I'm trying to word this the best way I know how, as far as a question, but like, what is the, it, how much is it is, is physical? How much of it is, is just breaking the barriers of your mentality, knowing that you can throw hard um, and, and kind of, uh, I guess in the best way that you can, it kind of explain that process. <laughs> Yeah, I think one of the biggest things that we've discovered at at uh, through all of our biomechanical research is that you have a signal. You know, you have guys. If there's, you can really kind of measure someone's potential in a lot of ways, right? So if they have a really fast arm, and you've been through it actually with Texas, you know, we actually yeah. screened, uh, we actually screened Robbie. Yeah, uh, and so you see, like those I'm were weird, to, man. <laughs> they are. They Sorry are. for interrupting you, but those were a little balls weird. naked, you know. No, that, I mean I do that every Thursday night actually yeah, at seven. There, there you go, perfect. Yeah, yeah I don't doubt that. <laughs> but, you have you get the arm speed, and so say someone has really high arm speed, but they throw eighty eight. You know why? Like they have the arm speed of a of a Verlander, but they throw eighty eight. Well, there's a there's a disconnect right there. There's some issue there. There's not some inefficiency that's happening, and so you have so you predict this person like, hey, this person could throw really really hard if we trained him the right way and, and unlocked his velocity, right? So that guy's a fast responder. And, but you got to be careful because if he has really high arm speed, he's more likely to be hurt. So you have to program him correctly. Actually, Matt Boyd is a really good example. Yeah. Well, Boyd is a guy that's uh, a tremendous athlete, um, could have played you know multiple sports in college, mm-hmm. and was a two-way player at the first year at, at, um, at Oregon State his freshman year. Mm-hmm. And he was always 86 to 88, touching 90 or so. And then once we screened him and rehabbed him, you know, his velocity jumped. And we're like, why? Why did his velocity jump? You know, And why does he throw so hard? with minimal work and Trevor Bauer throws 95 plus, but he has to put in so much volume. Like right. why did that happen? And so then through those questions and answers, we finally found out that, yeah, there's a kind of a fingerprint. This is like Trevor's a really slow responder. He has a slow arm. So he has to have a lot of volume. And then a Matt boy is a really fast responder. So he doesn't need a lot of volume. So that's, uh, that's the cool stuff that we found. And, but the mentality is number one, like you have to believe you can do it. And reality is people ask, why is velocity just skyrocketing in the big leagues? You know, why is it going up? Why is it going up? What are they doing? Is it long toss weights? What is it? You know, and um, reality is, is that uh, it's just more and more guys throwing a hundred at the yeah, big league level. Normal. You see, yeah, when you see it and you're like you're playing an indie ball and you're in normal or you're in uh, you oh, know geez. somewhere in Indi- you know somewhere <laughs> in Grand Prairie or something, um, you know, it's just. Well, to get back, I have to strike everyone out, and I have to throw hard. Like you just have to. Like this, so the concept of you just getting out at eighty-eight to ninety or whatever is no longer a thing that you would ever consider. You know, so as a result, people's velocities just go up because they have to. 
And that's uh, that's I think the number one reason. Yeah, it's, a, it's adapt or die, man. And, and I always ca- I kind of talk about this a lot on my show, man. Is like because when I got drafted in 2010, like you know I was, I was pretty high pick, but it was never like when I got to affiliated ball, it was never like hey throw harder, throw harder, throw harder. It was like yo like get outs, right? Get outs by any means necessary. Like we don't care about velocity. That was kind of like the big whole like affiliated ball secret was it doesn't matter how hard you throw it, it matters like if you're getting outs and your ERA looks good. And now I think that secret's out, right? Wouldn't you say like now it's like holy smokes, we got to you know, we got we got to adapt or die here. It's frustrating, right? Because you have coaches it's frustrating for everyone, I think, because the coaches are still a lot of the coaches are saying the same thing, right? So you sit down with your coordinator and you've got a three something in double a and your coordinator is like you know you're getting out so we love it you know doing a great job yeah you know and you don't make you get into the all-star team and then you get passed up you don't get promoted to triple a and you don't get invited to big league camp and you put up threes two years in a row in double a and you're like the hell's going on right. you know, i'm not getting any younger and it turns out that the front office the entire time views you as an org guy and like you're that you're never going to compete at the big league level because your velocity is not good enough your breaking ball is not good enough but the coach Likes the fact that you get outs, you know, like, so he doesn't want to say anything because every time he runs you out there, game's an hour shorter, sure. right? Like, you actually get outs, and you're a professional, you do your job. Um, but it turns out that those things might not be related to actually getting promoted to the big leagues. Yeah. But that information never gets back to the player. And there is never – the greatest possible example of this is independent baseball. Yeah. Right? Like, if you – like, we so can talk true. for a long period of time so about true. this, but you've done a couple stints. You know, like, if you're just getting outs – no matter, even if you're throwing 97 and you got a hammer and you're getting guys out, the manager is doing like he's torn between a rock and a hard place. It's right. good for the club to sell your contract into baseball, but it's also good that if you stay here and continue to get out for him, you know, <laughs> you just win. Yeah, you win. Right. So it's tough, and so these coaches are caught between in a tough place in the front office. Sometimes their information doesn't get down there. So really, a lot of the coaches are saying the same thing they were saying when you got drafted, but it doesn't mean the same thing. Yeah. You know, like what people got to realize. Is your double A pitching coach has almost no input on if you pitch in the big leagues or not. His 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 opinion almost doesn't matter, right? It's all about like the front office. How do they value? How do they see you? What do your pitch metrics go? Because they're really good at projecting you know, who's going to be a good big leaguer or not. I mean, that's the power of data. So as a result, like you you got to do what's best for your career, not necessarily what's best at the level you're at. Hey guys, it's me again. Yeah, interrupting the show uh, for the ads, but I will say, just go ahead and hit that next thirty seconds. Yeah, no, it's so true, man. Um, so you, you mentioned data again. I want to dive into your your. Uh, you mentioned this earlier as far as track goes. Can you kind of give my audience a brief explanation as far as what that is? A, da- a data driven player development system. Yeah, track is is the best way to describe it. Sh- briefly, is uh, we had Google Sheets. And we had Google Sheets for all of our players and everything and all this back end, and it literally broke. Uh, Matt Daniels designed this awesome Google Sheets whole network of stuff. Um, he now works for the San Francisco Giants as a coordinator. Yeah. But uh, it just got to a point where it's like, all right, this literally no longer works. What the hell are we going to do? we got to do the right thing. So that we started exploring a lot of um, – programs out there like coach p plus and a lot of those other things get uh, connects and yeah. a lot of other things but um they just never no one has really written software for baseball right like it, a lot of it is just general weightlifting and, and football and stuff like that but as you know baseball is very sensitive you sure. can't just be like hey uh, we're gonna throw here's your throwing program you know when you build programs for your clients right you you don't just give them a template that you copy you no. know, whatever and they throw. player it's, specific it's a, yeah, and even and then for the player, it's it's day specific, right? Like if they come back seven days later and like, oh, my arm was a little sore, or I left thirty throws in the tank, you're like, okay, well, we got to adjust it now, right? right? Every week, right? So, but that becomes really hard to do for five hundred athletes, you know. And uh, you know, I hope you become that successful because you'll see, <laughs> dude. I was gonna say, like, I'm like, holy smokes, man! I think I'm doing pretty good with you know, double just hitting double digits. <laughs> no, but you'll, you'll see, because you'll, you're gonna be successful. I mean, you, you get how social media is. You're gonna get to hundred athletes, and you know. You're like, okay, you know, as you, uh, if, if that happens, you get towards the end of your playing career and you transition into coaching. You know, if that happens down the road, then like you're going to be like, okay, well, now I have more time. Right. But then eventually, when I'm 75, an athlete, an athlete is always like, I have more, I just got to work harder. That's what an athlete always thinks. Right. A good athlete is like, if I just work harder, I work more hours, I'm going to solve this problem. And it turns out that that's just not true at some point, right? You become right. so successful that you actually need a system. And track is the answer to that solution where it tracks. 
all the uh, weighted ball throws, the intensities, the volume, sleep tracking, weightlifting, and it actually calculates workload based on all those things automatically inside a database that has logins so the coaches can see it, the administrators can see it, the players can see it, you know, and we've been developing it for over a year and a half, two years now, and it's been a blast. I mean, like, it's so much money to develop. I can't, I can't it's absurd how much it costs us, costs us, we'll continue to develop it, um, but it's it, we needed it. We built it for us. You know, right. people think that we built it to sell it, and the reality is, is pro teams have been interested, and we're not selling it to the pro teams because it's not ready for that level of scrutiny. We do sell it on a smaller level to colleges and amateur organizations who love it. It powers a lot of um, it powers a lot of gyms in the country here for baseball, and they love it. Right. Uh, and it's how we can actually spread our training and our message best. You know, we think that it'll be good. And down the line, you know, it'll be an individual program. And then, you know, our online training is entirely through track. And then down the line, our free ebook, it's going to go away, the PDF, and it's just going to be in track and it's going to be free. And then you can track everything there. You know, it's going to, like, that's what we're going to do a lot of. So it's just going to replace a lot of our PDFs and spreadsheets that we hand out. And eventually we're just going to have everyone on, you know, everyone can start on there for free. And that's the future. You know, we're not there yet, but we want to be able to do it. We're, you know, we know what's going to happen. If we open it up for free, we're going to get like, you know, 5,000 people signing up and the right. site's going to crash and we're going to not be ready for it. You're so we break make Google sure, again. <laughs> yeah, we want to make sure we're responsible about it. But yeah, it's, it's an awesome thing. It continues to be under development, but it's the future of, uh, of tracking baseball workloads I, for sure. And ultimately, we don't want it to be driveline specific. Like we want it to be like, hey, I don't use weighted balls. I, I don't believe in this. I, I like to lift weights more. I like to run long distance. Okay, that's fine. You know, here's your login. You create your own workout. And then it's, it has nothing to do with driveline. It's just it's a way that you can track things. Uh, and to be honest, if a coach is like, we do things differently, here's how we do it, and they're getting really, really, really good results using track and their thing, then I want to learn from that guy. Right. Why did that work? You know, oh, I could do something better. Why was that guy right? Why was I maybe wrong? You know, I don't have an ego in this. Like, I want to learn from that guy. That guy, that guy knew something. You know, and what, what did he know and why did he know it? Maybe he doesn't know exactly why. You know, but like there's a scientific reason behind why he is good. And let's find that out together, you know, and, and make sure he gets the credit. And, that, and that's what I think a lot about. I think that's like the biggest thing in the in the in the community in the, in the baseball industry, man, is like check the ego at the door. Right. I mean, yeah. there's so many good resources, especially with the blow up of social media these days. There's so many good resources out there. And and even for me, like going to the instructional side, it's like the first thing that I noticed was like, holy smokes, man, like as much as I thought I knew I, I, there's just as much of stuff as I don't know. Right. And, uh, every player is going to respond differently. And I think it's yeah, just checking the, checking the ego at the door and, and understanding that. Right. Yeah. And there's so much out there. You got to come up with your own system. You, know, you try a really good athlete tries everything, you know, and he has resources. You, you were a high draft pick and you played a lot of pro ball. You have coaches inside the game. You trust, you have players inside the game. that are at the big league level. You know, you talk to Jack Flaherty, you talk to all your friends mm -hmm. and you find out what, what do you think about that? What do you think about that? Yeah. And then eventually you try a few things and, and some things are not for you and some things you like. And then you come into and so what I like about your content. There's a lot of reasons I like your content, but one <laughs> Thanks, of them man. is that it's very specific. Like you have a very, you really hammer. I don't know if you do this on purpose, but this is what I get from it. Uh, you, you hammer a routine. You hammer, this is what you should do, but you're, you're not concrete. Like, this is what you're going to do ev for every, all the time. Right. Like, you're like, in the morning, I do 10 to 20 minutes of mobility. Um, and this is what I do. This is what I found to be valuable. Uh, this is what I do. This is my very, uh, I adhere to this keto diet. I adhere to this, this, this. And I have a routine. You know, you're changing it all the time because you're always learning and you're always right. adapting. But you have a routine, and, and kids need that. In the, if they're going to be successful, pros need that. Every pro has a good routine. You know, every good pro who's lasted a long time has a routine to their game and has whether, you know, it makes sense to them. And they're always changing it and they're always adapting it. But to them, when they wake up to when they go to sleep, they know what they're going to do, you know, and they're going to, if, you know, adversity happens and things change, they're going to, they're going to be okay with that. But they have a, they have a framework of what they want to do that day for the next 24 hours. And I think that's really important. Yeah. I think the coolest part of it is, is like, dude, like, do you, do, as an athlete, do you really know what it is? like what that secret sauce is going to be for you until you implement some other things, right? Like maybe you're doing a disservice to yourself if you, if you don't try, you know, this certain curveball grip or if you don't try this, this certain cue on a changeup. Like I know there's that fine line of like you don't want to change too much, but at the same time, like just I'm such a routine nerd slash geek, whatever it is, is like I'm trying to, you know, how can I best 
freaking wake up in the morning and feel fantastic. You know, maybe I need to implement this strategy or that. And I just think there's so much, uh, there's so much room for that in, in any person, athlete, whatever, like in their life. Um, yeah. You know, you get people, I always use this athlete cause the old school guy through a, I think he threw a no hitter, maybe a perfect game and David Cohn, right. And he's, we've talked now yeah, on, Twitter, he's just on Twitter, MLB but, network. Right. I love watching David because when he grew up, you know, when he played, he threw from three different arm slots. He threw five pitch. You know, he threw different pitches from every arm slot. And yeah, his velocity was only okay at the time. You know, but he threw all different types of stuff. And he tried to get the batter out no matter what. You know, so he was an ultimate competitor, in my opinion, between the lines. But then you, you, today we have this whole thing where it's like, oh, let's just throw strikes and have a very repeatable delivery, and let's do this. And you, you, I think coaches don't understand that you're really professionalizing the game at a young age. Right. You know, it's like, let's repeat it. Let's do this. Let's do what you see on TV. Let's attack this way. And until you master your fastball command, you can't do this. It's like, there's no way David Cohn did that growing up. He threw from three different arm angles. He screwed around. He, he, he found any way he could to get the batter out. And you know what? It was fun. Did was you hear fun. his, uh, his interview on no, MLB network? I, I didn't know. Bro, dude, it was fantastic. I forget now. I'm, I'm going to, I, of course, now I forget the name, out. but, uh, I can, I'll send it to you. I actually just made a post on it. It's on my Instagram. Um, okay. but he was talking to Al Leiter and he, and Al Leiter asked him like, Hey, why did you do that? Right. Why did you throw from like 17 different arm angles? And he goes, right. dude, I was a kid like growing up playing wiffle ball in the backyard. I was trying to emulate and he mentioned the guy's name. I forget who it is now, but he was like, I was just having fun. You know, like that was fun for us. Like, how can you get the hitter out? You throw from this angle and you throw from that angle. Shoot, man. Like I watch, uh, I got some footage of Stroman. I, I found footage of Stroman doing his like pregame warm up routine and, and playing catch. And he's like, he's just having fun, man. He's throwing from Summerine. He's throwing from sidearm. I mean, obviously Stroman's like, you know, for those of you who don't know, is a freaking freak athlete, but it's it's just that, right? Like, it's not so much like specific, like, all right, come down from leg lift, separate your hands. Now you're closed. Now you're leading with the heel. Now you're, you know, on top of the ball. It's just being an athlete, and I think that's something like you mentioned, man. It's like kind of, uh, you know, kind of getting misinterpreted as, as we progress into this, uh, the, like, you know, the the pitching lesson, I guess, uh, society that we kind of live in. Yeah. Now. It gets misinterpreted as not caring. You know, if you throw from a different arm angles, you screw around. It, you overthink. You're it. not taking it seriously. You're serious, not. You're not. You don't care about your career. You're just screwing around. And on some level, yeah, you don't. It's got to be fun. On some level, baseball's supposed to be fun. You know. But on the other hand, it's it's when you get there, the, the hitters are so freaking good that oh. you need everything. You know, and you never know what's. And you just said it. You know, ten minutes ago, you, you never know what it, you said it in the context of training. Like you never know what's gonna you know click for you, but that's also true on the pitching side. You never know what's gonna actually work until you go do it, and um, that's I think the value of Rapsodo and TrackMan and all these other things that you can get now because you can actually screw around and see how it affects right. the data, and then from that you may find out that you you should do things a little bit differently and maybe um, not the way that your coach says. You know, I think it's really cool. Yeah, there's no guessing, right? Like you're taking right. the guess out of it. Um, yeah, but you still got to screw around. I mean, that's the best thing. Like the best way to find out if if something's going to work is to just try it and to try everything and to have fun with it. And uh, so it turns out that you know we're not trying to take that out of the game. We're actually trying to put it back in with the, with this data. So uh, I, I again, I don't want to I don't want to uh, you know take up your whole day here, but I, I am curious because I got a lot of a lot of questions regarding this as well. Is like when do you think it's appropriate for the youth? pitchers or youth athletes sorry to get introduced into like the realm of you know data analytics pitch profile spin rate spin efficiency you know degrees and all of that stuff so I, I think you can i think it's a cool thing to do to kids that are like 10 to 12 years old you just set up a rap soto and they can see it and they can compete and they have fun because they get a general understanding of it right but mm-hmm. um you're not really trying to maximize it you know you just can show it to them because at the end of the day they're going to watch baseball and if, if you want your kids to watch baseball which i think is a good idea <laughs> they they watch mlb network and they watch games and they hear oh spin rate and they hear al lighter talk about it and they hear uh you know mike petriello and they hear all these guys talk about the advanced metrics and they're going to have questions Right. So you got to you got to expose them to that kind of stuff. Um, But then you probably, you know, you want to start maximizing it right around when they're like 16 or so, like 14 to 16 years old. You can really start talking about it and using it every day, you know, in the training. Um, But until then, you know, the two things that matter and scouts care about most are fastball velocity and fastball command. So everything's got to start with that. You got to learn how to throw a ball before you can pitch it. You got to learn how to optimally move your body. You got to get strong. Um, so you got to be in the weight room and so forth. But I, I've never been a believer of people saying like, oh, um, if you don't get eight hours of sleep and you don't eat right, then you shouldn't take creatine. You shouldn't take <laughs> multivitamin. You shouldn't take supplements. It's just like, look, 
the reality is, is some kids just like they're not they're not mature enough to do some things, um, and they're some they're mature enough to do other things. Like so, if you're going to tell them not to like take supplements that we know that work or whatever, um, and but they, because they don't sleep or whatever because they're not taking their career serious, it's like, I, I don't believe that. You know, so the same thing applies to rap soda and all that stuff. You know, like oh, if you throw seventy miles an hour, but you're wasting all your time on a rap soda, like you're just not allocating your time properly. It's like look, we just can't. He can't throw seven days a week for velocity. Sometimes he's going to want to work on his curveball. Because he's got to get guys out in freshman baseball, and he wants to, right. he wants to learn more. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know. So for me, it's like if they're just exploring it and having fun with it, then I think that that's a great thing. And then you know, professionally, okay, hey, I'm a draft guy. I'm going to go to area codes, or I'm starting to be pretty good, and I'm getting some questions. I need to take that leap. All right, it's time to incorporate the it's time to incorporate data, time to incorporate uh, the rep soto, time to incorporate blast sensors if you're a hitter on an everyday basis. Right around then, right when you're like, okay, uh, not only am I getting seen as a prospect, but I want to play. You know, I want to play professional baseball. I want to play college baseball. All right, and I want to put in the work. And so, if that's the case, all right, now we need to incorporate it on an everyday everyday basis hey guys i uh i'm sorry this is the last time i promise uh, just a personal question man what has been your favorite kind of tech piece of technology uh that you've got to geek out over it's kind of funny man it's actually on the hitting side like i i think Boo. i understand <laughs> i get it but i think blast sensors people ask me all the time like if you had one thing to buy for the hitters, what sure. would you buy? And it's blast sensors. Like yeah. it's amazing to see barrel speed, attack angle, all this other stuff that is like truly impactful and at a very low price. You had a hundred bucks and you pair it to your phone and you can just get and you can hit all the time and you get all this unbelievable information on swing path and what's good and if you're getting better, if you're getting more athletic, right? Your bat speed, your attacking. It's just it's tremendous for the price. You can't beat it. It's just amazing. Like I, I love it, and I think it's a great. I think it's a great thing. A blast sensor, a diamond kinetic sensor, anything that, yeah. that gets you that kind of bat path information. Dude, um, I, I, yeah. I was just on the phone with KVS, man. <laughs> I was like, yeah. you guys got to do something for the pitchers because it's pretty much the same. Uh, you know, same thing. You know, yeah, yeah, we have it. Yeah, we use them for the hitters, and it's awesome. And KVS is a tremendous. Piece do you of use them for the pitchers? Uh, they're not yet, but they're going to, yeah. they're working on it. Yeah. They're yeah. working on it. But, uh, if for the hitters, it's awesome. It's just, it's pricey. So it's great. If I was a facility owner, you know, then I would get a K vest and I would, I would use all, I would let my kids use it. But if I'm a dad listening to this podcast or I'm a kid and I want to know what's best, you know, K vest five grand, it's pretty expensive, you sure. know, but like blast and DK a hundred dollars and you can go with it. And then the diamond kinetics ball, you know, is, is another great example right around that price point. Um, which gives you spin rate, it gives you extension, it gives you arm angle, it gives you uh, break, and uh, you know that's I think a really good piece of technology for the dad and the kid. They want to get into it. You know, it's a hundred dollar ball. They use it, and you can get all this great information, and the kid can compare it to what's on TV. You know, I think I love that. So I, anything that's affordable, that's reliable, um, I, I like that. So to me, it's the blast sensor and the DK sensor, and for me, it's the DK ball. I think yeah. those are those are the pieces of technology that are going to change because that's something you can go to Dick Sporting Goods. You know, when, when it's out there, you know, I'm sure they're not necessarily in stores yet, but like, you know, that's to me like, no one. I still hold out that that's how a lot of baseball stuff's going to be discovered. It's not going to be people on the internet finding you and me. To be honest, it's going to be <laughs> dang it, dads and kids. <laughs> yeah, but that's when they're serious. They sure. start to look on the internet when they're serious. But like, you know, they're going to go to Dick Sporting Goods. They're going to Come their friends it. on their little league team or whatever. They're going to be like, oh, what's that? You know, why do you, why do you use that? And how much is that? Is that affordable? Why do you, can you show me the app? And right. if they can create a great experience with that, then they're going to go on the internet and they're going to be like, all right, maybe I want private lessons from Robbie, and maybe I want to do online <laughs> pitching with Driveline, or I want to do this. You know, like. Then, then that's when that's when we're going to be involved, you know. But like, it's got to be organic at a younger age. And so, to me, anything that approaches uh, affordable for that youth market is um, is really exciting to me. For those of you guys who are listening, um, if you if you are listening and you want to check some of that stuff out that Kyle just mentioned, uh, I will link all of that in the show notes at so the RobbieRoshow dot com forward slash Bodie o eight o. But, uh, but, dude, thanks so much for your time, man. Like I said, I want to be respectful of your time today. Um, with that being said, man, I'm curious as far as, like, what, what are you working up? What are you cooking up in the lab these days? What's the next project? You know, the big thing is uh, how we're 
working on with pro ball <laughs> is like how we're going to continue to work inside professional baseball. But I mean, the number one hardware thing we're working on is, uh, it's awesome. It's this, it's this unit called the, uh, we call it the impulse device. It'll sit on the ground. It's got a pulley. You attach it to the barbell and it measures speed of the barbell. Right. I know you're familiar with velocity right. based training, but this stuff is, uh, it's a low cost, op- it's a low cost alternative to things like the Tendo analyzer, which could be $1,800. Uh, it's way more reliable than an, ins- than an IMU, um, like a, a sensor that sits on the bar. Um, and it is cheap and we make it ourselves. Uh, and man, I'm so pumped to announce it. You know, we've, we posted videos of it. It's been delayed a couple times, but I was just watching our sports scientist and our engineer, um, test six units at the same time versus, um, the gold standard technology. And it was one to one. I mean, oh, it was no awesome. Kidding. So, wow. And it's going to come out, it's called the impulse device. And I, I, I don't have anything to sell to you right now, but, um, <laughs> it's going to come out over the next couple months and it's going to be out there and I'm, I'm pumped, man. So it's really cool. So that's, that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. We're, we're trying to drive the cost down on a lot of things. And sure. this is our first thing that we've really made in house technology wise. We do all the boards, we do all the 3d printing, everything so that's the stuff that i'm just like i'm, I'm jazzed about because i want to i want to bring that stuff and i want to be known for making stuff and that's what i want to do yeah no doubt dude i just i dude uh, i just get so lost sometimes going to your website like i go to the research page and i just <laughs> yeah, a lot. six hours later dude i'm just like whoa where where have i been the last day <laughs> but yeah that's gonna a, come out to beautiful seattle dude beautiful. i know man i know i know i do i mean i'm i'm a california boy so it's like if i ever go back home it's right for me, it's like right up the road, knowing I've all the go. long distance drives I've done. But um, you know, with that being said, man, where can my audience find you? I'll link all this in the show notes as well. I'm sure yeah, everyone I'm already very knows. Active. <laughs> Super active on Twitter and Instagram. So Twitter is driveline bases uh, at driveline bases, uh, and then Twitter is at driveline baseball. And then the website, if you want to get lost like Robbie does, you can go on <laughs> drivelinebaseball.com forward slash research if you want to go on that specific page. Oh yeah, but there's a lot on there too. And then of course our driveline plus offering has been really really popular lately, which uh, you know. Uh, we pay a yearly pay a yearly subscription. You get access to all of our videos that we're updating every single week. We put out three to five every week, uh, and then discounting pricing on all of our stuff. So think of it like uh, an Amazon Prime for baseball. It's kind of oh, that's treated. fantastic. Yeah. Nice, man. Well, hey, dude, again, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Thank you so much for what you do for the industry, man. Um, and I'll sign you off off the air. All right. You bet. Thanks, Robbie. Yo. All right, guys. Uh, much appreciated for you guys tuning into today's episode with Kyle Bodie. Again, uh, all of the links can be found in the show notes over at therobbyroshow.com forward slash Bodie 080 B O D D Y 080 therobbyroshow.com forward slash Bodie 080. In there, you'll find links to some of the blogs that he talked about in this episode. Um, obviously, his website and his all, all of his social medias. You'll see um, a couple of research papers in there. You'll also see opportunities to buy the products that he was talking about and um, other stuff. <laughs> and that Watch Momentum YouTube video. Absolutely. And then all of my services as well. Cool. Uh, like I said before, man, if you... Uh, have yet to subscribe to this podcast please do so i um i'd highly appreciate that and if you want to go like the next step go ahead and leave a written review or a five star i mean those are always dope right but if not i won't hold it against you you guys enjoy the rest of your day much love god bless talk to you later